This is the lecture for Thursday, the 4th of February, 2021, for European history. People should have their notes out. Question? No. You sure? Okay. I wasn't trying to put you off. Be happy to answer it. Uh, please make sure you have your notes out. What we have been talking about, um, industrialism and socialism, we now move into romanticism, which is not lovey-dovey guy-gal stuff. Romanticism is an intellectual movement in this context, and it has a very particular idea. I explained history to you as a conversation where people go back and forth about ideas. I also explained the process of history a bit like a volley in a tennis game, where the ball goes back and forth. Well, Romanticism is a volley against the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment's hyper-rationality. Consider the... Uh, picture of the American dream, which I, which I suggested to you. What is the American dream? Please have your note packs out. The American dream is an if-if-then statement. If all people have priceless value, as Christians maintain, being made in the image of God, immortal soul, that sort of thing. And if all people can learn reason, as the Enlightenment philosophers maintain. Now, note, the Enlightenment philosophers are not saying that all people have reason. All people have a capacity to learn reason. You take human beings in their natural state, and we are brutal, emotional, panicky beasts. We are not our best selves. If, and only if, we dedicate ourselves to appreciating objective reality, and a reality that is beyond our wants and our hopes and our preferences, if, and only if, we develop a capacity for logic, which is thinking reasonably, and not with our glands, we can overcome this beast that's inside of us. And don't tell me you don't have a beast inside of you. You do. You're the descendant of millions of years of evolution, if you believe in that sort of thing. Or you are a child of Adam and Eve. And therefore you are tainted by original sin, if you believe in that sort of thing. Or you were born into a universe whose sole purpose is to trap your soul in a uh, trap of suffering. As Buddhists believe, I could go on. You aren't good enough when you are born. You have to learn reason. You have to learn logic. You have to learn to tame or control the beast that's in you. If you don't, you get to go to prison or get shot or in some other way meet the end of an out-of-control mad dog criminal. You have to learn it. But Enlightenment philosophers imply, or actually they explicitly say, that all people, and they're excluding obviously people who were born with birth defects that prevent them from developing a full brain and nervous system, but with that exception, all people are capable of learning reason. Which, if they want to, is true. So, if we're all valued, as Christians maintain, and if we all can learn reason, as Enlightenment philosophers maintain, then our natural state should be to be free because we are capable and worthy of ruling ourselves. One of the basic lessons of life that I have tried to convey to you these many months is that if you control yourself, no one else need control you. If you as a teenager demonstrate to your folks that you have a history of solid, responsible, common-sense decision-making, they will grant you more freedom than if you have a sibling or a relative who's basically an irresponsible whack job. That's a scientific term. 
It's true. And it's because they feel that they have a responsibility for you until you reach the age of responsibility yourself. If you can demonstrate that you are responsible beyond your years, you'll have freedom beyond your years. That's the way of it. That's why jails exist, because certain adults and children can't control their dark impulses, and therefore they need to be controlled and kept away from the rest of us for our safety, and frankly, for their own safety. If you believe in the capacity of human beings, everyday common human beings, to be wise enough to rule themselves, then you believe that we should be free. That's the American dream. And de Tocqueville talks about it. Alexis de Tocqueville was a French Republican who came to the United States in the 1820s. And he toured the country to try to inspire France in its Republican hopes. His book, Democracy in America, is something that all educated Americans should know about. Ideally, you should have read excerpts from, or should read excerpts from, but all of you should know about it. Democracy in America. Tocqueville makes a bunch of incredibly incisive insights about uh, how and why American freedom seems to work. One of his observations is that, look at the deep frontier. On that frontier, you've got families and individuals isolated hundreds of miles away from the nearest courthouse, from the nearest officer of the law, and look what they do. Most of them, most of the time, do the right thing. You couldn't trust that to happen in France. You couldn't trust that to happen in Germany or anywhere in Europe. But it happens in the United States. Why? Why is it that most of the time, most Americans do the right thing? And de Tocqueville's answer is our religiosity. Then, as now, the typical American was more innately and inherently individually religious than their European counterpart, with exceptions. The typical American versus the typical European. Now, yeah, Christianity, like all religions and all human things, has its catalog of historical crimes and excesses. Nobody's denying that. I'm certainly not. But if you appreciate the basic Christian message, you will understand that your duty in life and your glory as a Christian in life is to try to be your best self at all times. Your best self. To be generous instead of grudging. To be loving instead of angry. To be humble instead of prideful. To be honest instead of deceptive. To be courageous instead of cowardly. All of these things. We are supposed to be our best selves in the moments that we are given. What that means is that because of their religiosity, because of their Christianity, even typical frontiersmen do not usually engage in rape, arson, theft, or murder. There are exceptions. But in general terms, the American people police themselves because they see themselves as accountable to God. Because the American, police them, American people police themselves, we do not need a government to do it for us, except in extreme cases. So de Tocqueville's arguments on the limit of government, on a limited government, those arguments are rooted in the notion that Americans don't need an intrusive government because, being religious, we will try to do the right thing most of the time. At least most of us will. So, anyway, that is a rationalist way of looking at the American dream. Yes? I just wanted to add real quick, you said that the government doesn't step in until uh, they really need to, or until they feel threatened, as seen on and on. Okay, our government is not the government that Tocqueville talked about. Okay. Since the progressive era, our government has become a bloated, intrusive, meddlesome thing at the best of times. <laughs> the federal government of the United States was never intended to be what it now is. And the people who are behaving the way you are, I genuinely wonder if they even read the constitutional oath that they swore. But that's me. I'm a conservative Republican.
I don't like what the federal government is doing. But I can tell you in objective terms, neither Democrats nor Republicans before the progressive era of the late 18 and early 1900s would even recognize the government of the United States today as being anything related to what that Constitution says. Because it does too much. It collects too much money. It has too much power. Uh, and even modern conservatives like myself might seem more willing to put up with government power and government intrusiveness than they would, because they're just not used to it. In any event, the idea of freedom coming from the Enlightenment is that people who are common sense wise can police themselves. Don't need a government to do it, except again, around the edges in the extreme cases. But what romantics say is that you are looking at the mind in divorced from the rest of us. And in doing so, you limit your picture of life. Like a photographer taking a black and white picture, like a filmmaker making a black and white movie. Now, there are things you can do with black and white that you can't do with color. As a photographer, I can tell you, there are, you can get you can convey moods with black and white that you can't with color. Uh, you want to have sometimes very limited light in your picture, so you have stark uh, differences between light and shadow. You can do that with a movie in much more easy ways than you can do it with a, that's black and white than you can if it's color. It's like the difference between a moody black and white portrait with stark shadow and stark light on the one hand, and you get another portrait and the guy is just in a room with a birthday cake and it's normal lighting and everything's colored. You can convey different things. So there are places and times for black and white, but it's not showing you reality. It's showing you certain aspects of reality divorced from others. Hyper-intellectualism, hyper-rationalism, cogito ergo sum thought, is not human life. The romantics assert that human life includes that. But it's not defined by it. Because what human life really is about is passion. Wonder. Wow. Love. Lust. Terror. Anxiety. Hope. Warmth. These passions are what make our lives worth living, and they are what make our lives distinct. You cannot take the mind and assume that it's us. No. The mind is riding on a beast within that has the capacity for great love and great hate and everything in between. You might say to yourself, well, I don't hate. I'm a good person. I've never hated anyone in my life. Wait a while. Okay, I try to be a good person. I don't like the fact that I have hated people, and I certainly hate ideas. But I do. I don't apologize for it. I'm a human being. I try to control that. I try not to be defined by my hatred, because I know that anger and outrage is no replacement for rational thought, for our capacity for common sense. I understand all of that. But I'd be lying to you if I said that I never hated anyone or anything, because I have. And I suspect that all of you at some point will. Now, what you do with that is your business. I hope you will try to control it and not let it define you, because hate is a lousy way to live. But the thing about love and hate is they're the same. They're different kinds of the sides of the same coin. How are love and hate the same? They both involve intense regard. Intense regard for whatever the object of your love or hatred happens to be. You care about it. It matters to you. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of hate is not love. The opposite of both is indifference. If you're indifferent to something, that's different. It's like the opposite of war. It's not peace. The opposite of war is surrender, often enough. So what a romantic says, and romantics existed in literature, in art, in music, uh, in culture in general, is that we have allowed the rational self to eclipse the passionate self, and that that needs to change. You talk about Christianity, you enlighten people about how people are all, you know, valuable to God. But to be a Christian is not about an intellectual process. You can know the scriptures, you can know the theology of Christianity like you can know any theology. That doesn't make you a Christian. It makes you educated. 
What makes you a Christian is living in the presence of Christ, who is a person, and appreciating that God is showing you something by showing you what Christ was like. Christ is not defined by the Sermon of the Mount, on the Mount. Christ is not defined by his words. There came a point in his life where he chose to seek crucifixion. Again and again, on the path to the cross, the road of suffering and sorrow, the Via Dolorosa, he had opportunities to step away. He didn't have to go there. He chose to. And in going there, he suffered mightily, willingly. I'm going to finish and then I'll take it. What that reveals is the heart behind the little gospel. And God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son to die for our sins that we might have life eternal. This is not an intellectual thing. God, if you are a Christian, is revealing his nature. He's not a cold, angry judge waiting to send you to hell. He loves you more than you're probably capable of loving anyone or anything. And he's willing to go through that hell, that whipping and scourging and mocking and hanging there and being speared, all of it, all of it. It's a personal thing. Romantics would say that if you take that personal side out of Christianity, you're taking the Christ out of Christianity. You can't do that. Life is more complicated than the mind is capable of, re of, 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 of discerning. Life is about passion, at least as much as, it's about, as, as it is about ideas. Thank you. When you were saying that um, Christ had multiple options where he could turn away from the cross. Yes. That's, I, I, I don't know how much I agree with that. Considering you don't have to agree with what I say. I mm -hmm. just, I'm telling you what I think. Mm -hmm. Here's why I say that. Because you're asking, I, you're implicitly asking for evidence. Correct. Okay, first of all, Christ did not have to start a riot with the money changers. He chose to, yeah, he got angry, but he, he could have controlled himself. He didn't. That riot was one of the things that led to him being taken and tried. He also says in front of the Sanhedrin while they're trying him, uh, I am. I am is what God said his name was. That is Yahweh. That is what it means. When he said, I am to the Sanhedrin, he was identifying himself with the Godhead. That's sacrilege. And in the old Jewish law, that's a stoning offense. But the, they wanted to get the Romans involved. He goes to Pilate. Pilate says to him, I don't think you're uh, a dangerous fellow. Uh, are, are you king of the Jews? And if Jesus had said, no, the crowd is lying, Pilate, probably, Pilate didn't want to kill him. Again and again, Pilate tries not to. Jesus says, that's who you say I am. He's daring Pilate. In the end, his refusal to play Pilate's game causes Pilate to wash his hands of the situation and send Jesus to the cross. And even before that, between the time that he starts the riot and is with the Sanhedrin, instead of fleeing, which he knew, he knew Judas was going off to betray him. He knew that they were coming. He talked about it at the Last Supper. Instead of fleeing, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and is where Judas expects him to be. Mm -hmm. He could have prolonged his life. He could have escaped. He chose not to. So that's why I say... Yeah, the people who put him on the cross, they're responsible too. But he chose to go that route in order to demonstrate. That's that's my logic. You don't have to agree. Through my church, one of our doctrines is predestination. The, yep. the best way that I can describe that right now is God shows you the big picture, but it's like those puzzles that like you have the big picture that's made up of the smaller ones. God yeah. shows you the big picture, you're responsible for the smaller yes. ones. There are multiple places where Jesus made these decisions, yes. But if you, like, my main key evidence here mm -hmm. is looking at the Garden of Gethsemane. Yes. He prays three times to God yes. about not wanting... To yes, pray. yes, please let this cup pass. Which means he's sane. <laughs> okay, Jesus was not a madman martyr. Exactly. Even if you don't think he was God, he didn't want this to happen. He felt it mm -hmm. needed to. He said, not my will, God, but yours. I, I get your point, and I get the subtlety of mm -hmm. it. And on top of that, Pontius Pilate didn't necessarily, wasn't the only one who condemned Jesus to death. Well, he no, kind the of brought it upon did. the crowd. And yeah. the th no, P Pilate is an example of a weak leader. Mm -hmm. If you're responsible for other people, you're also responsible for doing the right thing. 
And Pilate's an example of a man who knowingly did wrong in order to be pragmatic, to avoid a riot, to avoid a blackening of his name because he can't control the Jews of Jerusalem. He condemns an innocent man knowingly. That's the story of Pilate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but yeah, I get your point. Uh, I, I hope you understand where I was coming from. We don't have to agree, by the way. I just, it's good that, that we we're able to talk. No BS, it really yeah. is. Violet. Um, so, real quickly with Jaden, I like I know that your church is a predestination church, but there is biblical reference for free will. So mm -hmm. there is a free will, and Christ could have being God, technically gone against his Father's will. So even Correct. though through predestination, he, like, even though God has a will, he didn't have to go through with it. It was oh, his right, choice yeah. to go through with it because of free will. And Predestination doesn't necessarily discount free exactly. will. Exactly. Yeah, it's a question um, of context or a perspective. Right. The way like I, I was saying, you have the big picture. God shows you the big picture, yeah. but it's up to you to create the smaller picture. Um, what translation do you, do you use? To For my personal use, I use the Revised Standard Version, which was the standard Protestant Bible. I, I also use the New Revised Standard Version, which is all gender neutrally because it's easier <laughs> to find material on it. But my preferred is the old Revised Standard Version, I think in 1952. What do you use? Um, I use New King James. Okay. That, King James is beautiful. Oh my it, it is It is incredibly elegant language, and I love that about it. Anyway. Uh, it's like Sunday school! Get me out of here! <laughs> it's part of culture. It's part of history. It's part of history. It is. Is it on the final? <laughs> what? Is it on the final? Uh, everything's on the final. The Please final put that on life. the final. What does um, Mr. Genorio believe about the Christ final. and the Christ? Life is the final. In any event, um, so, uh, passion is a necessary part, component of life, and what the Romantics insist on doing is putting passion front and center and displacing the intellect. Talking about wonder. Now, one of the first places that Romanticism takes hold is in literature. So the three great Romantic poets of England, uh, Percy Bysshe Shelley, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Lord Byron, are late 1700s, very early 1800s. This is before music. This is before uh, graphic arts. Um, and Percy Bysshe Shelley was the husband of Mary Shelley, who was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft, who was uh, one of the world's first great feminists. Mary Shelley is with, and I, can you move that, please? Is with um, Coleridge, yeah, because I'm going to pull this back, so just pull it up to the other side temporarily. Thank you. They're all in the Italian Alps. I'm going to stand on this. They're all in the Italian Alps having a, a, a vacation together. And they get isolated there by the weather, and they tell ghost stories. And the ghost story that Mary Telling Shelley tells, she writes down, is Frankenstein, a modern Prometheus which is one of the great stories of modern times. Now, at the time, she was considered Percy Shelley's wife and Mary Wollstonecraft's daughter. But the truth is, more people in modern times have been influenced by Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, a modern Prometheus, than they've even heard of Mary Wollstonecraft or Percy Shelley or Lord Byron or Samuel Taylor Coleridge. So it's funny how things turn out. Anyway, Sh Percy Bysshe Shelley, is a romantic poet, and he writes this poem called Ozymandias. Now, Ozymandias is the alternative name of the pharaoh of the New Kingdom, Egypt, Ramesses II. And can you aim the chair sort of towards me a little? Thanks. Hello! So, Ozymandias is an alternate, alternate name for a pharaoh of New Kingdom, Egypt, that is more successful than almost any other. A uh, guy who rules over 50 years. Many people think Pharaoh Ramesses was the uh, pharaoh of the, of the Exodus. I personally don't, because uh, Ramesses was a very successful pharaoh, and the pharaoh that lost the Jews, not so much. But in any event, uh, here's the poem. I'll read it, and we'll talk a little about it. Ozymandias. Percy Bysshe Shelley writes, I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive. 
stamped on those lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing besides remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, this lone and level sand, the lone and level sand stretch far away. Now, what did Ramesses mean when he had the sculpture made, this giant colossal version of himself, as he was going to go uh, a place on the border of his land? Well, if you've ever seen the, the Fellowship of the Ring, the first Lord of the Rings movie, excuse me, you know what it means. Uh, what it means is, thank you, in that movie, the Fellowship is going down the Great River on Dween, on boats. And they come to two cliffs that the river flows through. And on either side of the cliff is a massive colossal statue of a king, Anarion and Isildur. These are the old kings of Gondor, the Stone Land. And what, they're, what they are is they're a warning to the eastern barbarians. Come no closer into this land or you will encounter the guys who made these massive stone giants. Pretty impressive, designed to keep people away. Sort of the opposite of the Statue of Liberty. Send me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Um, so, look on my works, ye mighty in despair. What did Ramesses mean? That's a question. What did he mean? Yes. Uh, you, you moved your hand, like waving red meat in front of me like a dog. What do you mean? Um, Look on my work, she might eat despair. What do you mean? So, like, I can make, like, for big, great things. Like, I could do, like, I have a lot of power in things, so. Yeah. Ramesses was a fighter. He fought in the Battle of Kadesh, ruler of a big empire of Egypt. Um, clearly, what he meant was, you... Primitive screwheads, look on my works, a grand and powerful Egypt, and despair, because you will never be like us. You will never be able to take us. We are mighty. You are puny. That's the message. But what message is Shelley conveying with this poem and with these words? What message is he conveying? And I will call on someone if I don't get a... A volunteer. I prefer a volunteer that is not one of the usual talkers. What does he mean? Yes. Um, like the Colossus was destroyed, like the big statue was destroyed. So eventually, like even with Egypt's great power, it's still like it it was eventually vanquished. Yeah. <sighs> Look on my work, she mighty in despair. I was the most important man in the known world. I ruled the empire that was dominant in my time. Nothing remains. All glory is fleeting, as the Roman slave would say during a Roman triumph. All glory is fleeting. There will come a time when nobody remembers what that flag is or represents, when nobody will remember the United States. Maybe scholars, maybe not even them. If we survive our nuclear adolescence, if we get to have centuries and millennia of future, there will come a time when we will be forgotten. Everything that we think is worth living for, dying for, or killing for will be forgotten. It will happen. Because not only are we mortal as individuals, but that which we place so much faith in in the world is also a temporary transient thing. It will pass. New things will come, new crises, new conflicts, new ways of looking at things. If I were to tell you about the Manichaeans, who were a sect that believed in a conflict between light and dark, sort of a Zoroastrian-based Roman cult, most of you wouldn't have any idea of what that was. Some of you might. But people thought it was worth living for, dying for, and even killing for back at one time. So it will be with us. Look upon my work, she mighty in the spirit. It has to do with the mortality of us. Not just our bodies, but our culture. Everything. Quickly. Very quickly. Okay. 
So it, it kind of threw me back. Like what Finn said kind of threw me back to one of the quotes you have up there from Call of Cthulhu. Yep. The uh, given trains aeons, even death may die. Yes. So just that kind of mortality. Even with, in the Cthulhu mythos, the ancient ones who are objectively immortal. Yeah. But there's a reason why I start my course in ancient history with creation myths. Why I show movies that take us back and back and back and back and back so that you can see the whole universe with galaxy clusters like sand. Because what exists is so much bigger than what we normally think of. We are like passengers on an airliner focusing on when the stewardess is going to bring us our drink and watching the online movie, the on-flight movie. But in reality, we're five miles above the earth in a very, very, very delicate machine, hoping that nothing goes wrong. <laughs> yes. The Manichaeans are still around in, like, the Middle East, aren't they? Yeah, uh, the Zoroastrians are. They're called Parsis today, but they are. Uh, but Manichaean ideas, ideas of a, a world of a battle between light and dark, is very much a part of the world today. I feel like I... But it's not really the Manichaeans anymore. That idea has been cross-pollinated with others. Is the Manichaeans the, the religion with their symbol being the, like, drape over a, a cross? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Please close the shades and shut the lights off. We're going to go into some romantic paintings. If I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. Find out what that symbol means. Let me know, please. Okay. So, we're going to start out with the poster of the Romantic Movement painting, which was early to mid-1800s. This is Caspar David Friedrich's uh, Wanderer in a Sea of Mist. Now, if you remember a couple of years ago, there was a movie called Dunkirk about the great mm -hmm. evacuation of British and other troops from the beaches of Dunkirk, France, during World War II, when the Germans were closing in. And the painting, uh, the, the poster for that movie is based on this. It's a soldier looking out at the beaches of Dunkirk. Note the use of light and shadow. The man is standing on a foundation of stones, all of which is in shadow. The man is facing away, wearing black, all of which is in shadow. His face is not available. It is eclipsed by the backside of his head, shadow. But the light is passing past the man. It's coming from the sky. It's bouncing off the mists. You see the broad outlines of mountains. Now, I absolutely insist that art is experienced individually. So I could give a good goddamn what an art critic thinks of something. If it makes an impression on me, that's an authentic thing. I don't think that you should wait around for some expert to tell you what to think about art. I think that you should try to experience art and react to it. But I will tell you what the art critic world uh, and the historical world thinks of this painting. It's about the future. That's what they say. We are looking at the undiscovered country of the future. And in that undiscovered country, there are mists preventing us from seeing clearly. We have broad outlines, but we exist in the moment of shadow, in a flickering temporary present, gazing out into a future that is un largely unknown, where anything could happen, where anything could be. Also, the emphasis on the beauty of nature and placing man in a context of being surrounded by nature. You want to get out of your head sometime? If you're too busy worrying and thinking and can't stop, go for a walk in nature. Spend some time near a river or a brook in the woods on a hilltop. And let nature fill you. You'll have an idea of us. You'll be reminded that we exist in the context of nature. Now, do any of you have any thoughts or insights about this before we move on? I am not Mrs. Ketchum. I don't claim to be. I have my thoughts about art and my knowledge, which is somewhat limited. She is an incredible art historian. Yes. I think I've seen this used as the cover of Frankenstein. Like, Yeah, it was. And rightly so. No, that I could see very easily Victor Frankenstein searching the mountains. Yeah, which is from the book. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead... Okay, we'll come back to that. There we go. Why am I down here? Good. So the next painting I want to deal with is by Theodore Jericho, 
and it is the Raft of the Medusa. Now, another Romantic era painting. The color tone is almost a sepia black and white. There's very little broad gold color. But what there is, is a lot of light and shadow, contrasting. You've got human beings in contorted poses worthy of Michelangelo Bonarotti, clinging desperately to this raft that's disintegrating, that's being buffeted by waves, that has this little sail that's about to shred or be ripped off the raft. And the people who are still paying attention are looking up at this guy. And what's he doing? He's waving a, a cloth somewhere off screen, off camera, off canvas is hopefully a ship that might come and rescue these people. Now, what's going on here? This is what I think. The raft is civilization. It's human convention. We desperately cling to it but it's not up to handling the realities of life. If you doubt that, go out into a thunderstorm sometime and experiencing, experience it without a roof over your head. You will see how much we are in the context of nature. You will see how we cling to the artificial world of civilization that we have made. You know, the, a man is dying and there's an old story, an axiomatic story. Um, Somebody who knows him said, you, you've made a mess of your life. What are, you, what are you worried about? Wouldn't dying be a relief? And the guy says, yeah, I've made a mess of my life and it stinks. I hate it, but it's the only one I've got. Uh, quick thoughts on this. Oh. If you scroll in on the side, I think you can see a ship very small. Right? It's right up there. You see that right? Ah, uh, that could be a ship. Yes, that could be. Cool. Good eye. Uh, any other thoughts? There is actually a very interesting logical backstory that I may be fudging here. Okay, just be quick about it. Yeah, so. no, this was originally like the crew of a ship. The ship racked. They ended up building a raft from things that they could get. Yeah. And these are the survivors after they ended up having to resort to cannibalism. Well, I hate cannibalism. That's pretty horrific. But it's not, it's not impossible that you're right. In fact, it's likely. But again, desperation. Um, and... There will be moments in your life where you will be desperate. Hopefully not cannibal desperate, but desperate anyway. Lest you turn into a way to go. Now, uh, another painting from that. Ooh, look at that. Uh, <laughs> is uh, John Constable's The Great English um, Romantic Painter. And this is the Hay Wayne. Now, it has the Romantic Era's focus on nature. I love dramatic skies. My wife, when she met me, couldn't understand that. She looked at trees and brooks and, and the stuff on the ground and was deeply moved by that beauty. But, in fact, I love dramatic skyscapes. And she's come to appreciate them. So what do we see in this painting? Well, what we see is, uh, first of all, a dramatic sky where all the light's coming from. And the countryside is somewhat flooded. The human beings are a small part of what's going on, pulling their ox, you know, their, their, their carriage through the road that's flooded, a little dog, looking at the people like they're so important, but really they're surrounded by the houses, dominated by the trees near the house. Everything is dominated by that stark, incredible sky. So again, what's our place in the world? Romantics remind us our place in the world is a place in nature that we are not beyond nature, that our civilization should not disconnect from nature, because nature reminds us of who we are and what we are about. Okay. Then, uh, this is the Nightmare by... Uh, what's his name? Fuseli. Henry Fuseli. I'll keep that there. Now, this one. Let's talk about this one. <laughs> First of all, it deals with the universal fear of going to sleep. Because when we sleep, we're absolutely vulnerable. And the imp is at atop the, the woman. And there's this crazy, creepy horse peeking in. What you doing, Wilbur? I mean, it's just, it's just weird. That is not a normal-looking horse. In the background, you see the shadow of the imp with his round head and pointy ears. Or is that the imp? 
Could that be some other dark force? But I'd be lying if I denied the sexuality of this. This is an extremely sensual painting. It reminds me of the old classic Dracula movies, where on the one hand, the beautiful Victorian women so elegant are, oh, they're, you're so repulsive, Dracula, you're a horror, ah! But secretly they want him because he's such a bad boy. Ah! And that is here. The imp is on the woman. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. No, that's it. That's all of it. Thank you. Come again. A lot of people have seen that as a depiction for sleep paralysis. That could be. Also, uh, uh, quickly, lights, and then uh, we'll talk a little more.